I'm back. The year is 2010. I'm in a comic store hanging with some friends. One of my friends, who happened to work at this particular store, signals me to come over to the cash register. On his laptop is the trailer for Devil May Cry 5. In this video, I saw a very young man in a dark, gothic city fighting strange mannequin-like creatures. At the end, it's revealed this character's name is Dante. My friend and I looked at each other and said, wow, that looks kinda cool. I remarked, I can't believe they're making another prequel before Dante gets his white hair. My friend responds, no, you see, he's got the white hair. Look at his roots, he just dyed it black. <sighs> I happily walked home after my innocent shopping venture, knowing there was another DMC game in the works. It being one of my favorite video game franchises and all, I was pretty excited. When I got back home, I checked out the trailer again by myself and noticed that a lot of people were very unhappy with it. There were endless comments about Dante not having white hair, him being a smoker, which I know, it was gross, him being very skinny and unattractive, and pardon my language, him looking like a drug addict. I was genuinely surprised by this because, honestly, I thought the trailer looked pretty cool. It was hitting all the right goth rock vibes for me personally, and the very visible patch of white amongst this Dante's black hair had me immediately thinking this game would be a build-up to him getting that iconic white hair. No matter what I thought about any of this, fans were not happy. I remember seeing a lot of angry videos about this new character design back then. It's kind of crazy going back and watching some of those videos now, with the amount of slurs being thrown around in them. It was a very productive time to live through. Anyway, so this new DMC game, which at first we all thought was DMC5, was being developed by a western game company called Ninja Theory, the folks behind games like Heavenly Sword and Enslaved Odyssey to the West, both games that I happen to enjoy very much. Back when it released, DMC4 sold really well, but its sales weren't exactly what Capcom was looking for. At this point in time, having four full DMC games under their belt and feeling like they had done pretty much everything they could with Dante in the story and gameplay department, the decision to reboot the series had been on the Capcom higher-up table for a while. It was partially the reason why Nero came to be in the first place. The in-house Capcom devs were kinda done with making traditional DMC games at that time. Impressed with their work on Heavenly Sword, Capcom executives chose Ninja Theory to develop the next Devil May Cry game. In-house former DMC staffers would also provide support on this title, notably Hideaki Itsuno, the director of DMC 3 and 4. Itsuno-san would be overseeing this project, and would actually help with some design elements for the game's enemies and this title's combat. At the start of development, this game would be a more realistic take on DMC that would actually feel more in line with what came before in those previous games. Ninja Theory, being very big fans of Devil May Cry, wanted to keep that original vibe in mind with their reboot. It was quickly decided by Capcom Japan that they wanted NT to make the game feel very different in basically every aspect of its design and presentation. Apparently the decision to change Dante's hair color to black was so he would appeal to a younger Western audience. It's kinda crazy seeing this Dante's initial concepts being so similar to the Dante we all know and love before getting changed. The game's setting would be the colorful hell world of Limbo, a transforming, living environment that shifts around Dante as he explores. This living world idea came from the original DMC titles, demonic energy fields that would often trap Dante into those game's combat scenarios. NT wanted to take that idea a little further in this reboot, having the shifting world play into the actual level design, including all new platforming challenges and the ability to knock enemies off the world itself. So for a while, the trailers for this reboot looked and felt a lot like that initial announcement trailer, with skinny goth Dante. The industrial electronica was still there, Dante was still rocking that original spray-painted red jacket, and the overall industrial goth vibe was intact. This game really seemed like a more realistic, darker version of a Devil May Cry game. Again, I was excited for this. 
At a certain point, however, and I can't really pin down when this happened, a lot of this game's tone changed. Dante suddenly started to appear way more clean cut, his jacket went from primarily red with black highlights to just black with a pinch of red on his sleeves. The music itself began to take on a more traditional punk rock sound, while also maintaining some of that electronica, and we finally got to hear this Dante speak a little more. My name, by the way, is Dante. But you can call me Dante the Demon Killer. Has a nice ring to it, don't you think? Something about this guy felt very off to me, and I wasn't the only one who felt this way. In that first trailer, Reboot Dante came off as a dark and depressed type of character compared to the guy that we would eventually end up with. As more and more trailers released, the weirder this game began to look. I see you clearly. That's cool. You know, it's all real, you're there. Enjoy. My name's David Delator, I am playing Virgil. What's going on here? Seriously, it's like whoever edited these BTS clips wanted all of this to look bad. What seemed like a game with a realistic dark tone was now a strange, uncomfortably edgy, and very cringeworthy looking title that barely resembled the wholesome silliness that was original DMC. By the way, the game's official title was eventually revealed as DMC Devil May Cry. So, Devil May Cry, Devil May Cry. I get it, it's a reboot, but why not just DMC? Like, the letters? It's Probably really hard to market that. Close to this title's release is when we would get a playable demo for the game. The demo included two levels, one exploratory and the other a straight up boss fight. I was okay with this demo. The gameplay was a lot of fun, it didn't completely feel like a classic DMC, but what was presented was clearly a polished, well-made hack and slash video game. I still wasn't digging how the characters and story were being presented, however. I'm your prom date, you ugly sack of shit. You can't tell me. I'm 1,200 years old. You don't look a day over 12,000. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. But this was a demo, right? Obviously, I'd have to reserve my full judgment for when I finish the game, right? Honestly, the trailers leading up to this game's release had me kinda nervous. I can't stress enough how damaging this stuff was for fans of the original games. Everything shown off was being made fun of. Virgil eventually made a trailer appearance, and that did absolutely nothing to douse the flames of anger quickly building up around this title. I was just sitting there like, man, I really hope the game is that darker take on DMC, and not whatever is going on here. Now, there's something I want to talk about, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. All of what I'm about to say has been said before in much greater detail. I briefly touched on this at the start, but when this title was first revealed, fans were not happy. A lot of colorful language was thrown around at the developers and the game itself. On a lot of occasions, the devs at Ninja Theory would actually respond to fan concerns very angrily. I think it's kind of understandable when you're working on something that you're passionate about, but it's definitely not professional or appropriate. I think both sides, in a lot of ways, were in the wrong in saying the things that they said. I get not liking the direction a game is going in, but that's not a good reason to send death threats or just talk shit. For Ninja Theory, it's not a good look playing into that behavior as well. You're supposed to ignore the trolls, not feed them. And you're definitely not supposed to call the character that the fans like a gay cowboy, like that's some kind of insult. If angry fans are calling your character a homophobic slur, don't call the original character a homophobic stereotype. Like, you know it's bad, why throw gasoline on your already burning shoes? This whole era of Capcom is so infuriating to look back on. It's incredibly cringe on the dev side, and on the fan side, too. Anyway, if you guys want to learn more about this controversy, please check out Foxcade's video on it. He goes into way more detail about things that were said and how poorly they were received. Even though I'm not going to talk about the game's abysmal marketing and PR, I will, in fact, be diving deep into the actual content of the final release and the definitive edition of this game. And believe me, developer remarks or black hair Dante are not the real problems holding back the reboot. Without further ado, let's take a closer look at DMC. See, Devil May Cry. DMC Devil May Cry's basic gameplay is pretty similar to the previous games, but its combat system is very different. Aside from the typical hack and slash fare like exploring linear set levels, taking out hordes of demons, and collecting red orbs to upgrade your stuff, the new combat system and the way battles play out are the most notable things DMC brings to the table. So Dante still has a melee attack button, a gun button, and a jump button, but no lock on, and dodging is now mapped to the shoulder buttons and executed with a single button press. Unlike DMC, 
MC1, 3, and 4, where you had to lock onto an enemy and press a direction while jumping just to dodge roll, now it's as easy as ever to get out of the way of danger. Dante also has a launcher button to send enemies flying. In those previous titles, launching demons was also a lock-on directional-based input. Tapping launch sends enemies up, and holding down the button sends Dante with them. This action, while different in its execution, functions the same way as it did in those classic games. Delay-based combos and advanced abilities like Stinger also show up in this game. One of the goals with this reboot was to design a control configuration that would give old and new players ease of access in pulling off a very stylish-looking combos. That is definitely what you get here. It's a much more simplified combat system, but that isn't bad by any means. The basic hack-and-slash gameplay is pretty fun and easy to wrap your head around, no matter what your skill level is. Another new addition to the combat formula is how the unlockable weapons work. As you progress through the story, Dante will unlock angel and demon weapons. Angel weapons, by default, are mapped to the left trigger, and demon weapons are mapped to the right. Demon weapons are hard-hitting, slow bludgeoners that deal very high damage, while angel weapons are good at keeping crowds in control and are very fast at the expense of damage output. Dante also gets a hook that he can use in combat. Each of the triggers you hold down modifies this hook to either pull enemies in or to bring you to the enemy. It's a lot like how Nero's Devilbringer worked in DMC4, you just have more control over it. It's a perfect evolution of what DMC4 brought to the table and one of my favorite hack and slash game mechanics, believe it or not. The hook even has its own upgradable attacks, so you can combo in and out of attack strings with this thing. I really liked how the weapons were implemented. It harkens back to Ninja Theory's Heavenly Sword, where in that game you used a transforming blade, where in its basic form was good against single targets, and also had forms for crowds and dealing massive focused damage. It's very similar to that here in DMC. A lot of button delay combos can be finished with other weapons, which is something I don't think the original Devil May Cry series ever attempted. So when you perform a combo with a delay button input, while delayed, a glimmer of light will shine on Dante's currently equipped weapon. This is your visual cue to continue your combo. If you quickly hold one of the triggers during this pause, you can complete that other weapon's delay combo. This is actually so freaking cool, and is my favorite part about this wildly different combat system. It's super fun starting a slow combo with Dante's Axe Arbiter, and then finishing it with a Rebellion Spin, hitting every enemy around you. You can also do this for air combos, which both looks really cool and makes you feel like a badass. The guns Dante uses in this game aren't as exciting as the melee options available. Ebony and Ivory make their return, and you also get a pretty standard shotgun. Both are great for taking out airborne enemies, and actually do some pretty decent damage when upgraded against grounded threats. Rainstorm is back, but it's like the slowest, weirdest looking thing ever. Why so slow? One of the more interesting firearms you can get is something called Kablooey. It's an explosive dart gun that you can tag enemies with for a delayed explosion. Pretty good for setting up larger charging enemies in trap combos. And that's all I have to say about the guns. They're really not as eventful as your melee attacks. Going back to those close quarters weapons for a sec, one of the new changes I'm not too hot on is the new Stinger input. So once again, unlike the original games, Stinger is no longer a lock-on directional input. This time, Stingers are performed by tapping the movement stick twice in the direction of the enemy. So if an enemy is right in front of you, you have to press forward forward and then the attack button to zoom in on said enemy. This is very cumbersome and doesn't feel good when you want to throw one of these things out in the middle of a combo. It can also be easily interrupted by a passing enemy, or if two demons are right next to each other. That doesn't mean Dante is going to automatically choose the enemy you want to stinger. It's very strange and exists only because there is no lock-on in this game. This type of input isn't bad in concept. Bayonetta actually uses this as an alternative with its stinger input. That's the thing though, Bayonetta also has a lock-on button. It's not the only way to stinger, you have options in that game. In DMC, you don't. Hold your horses. We'll talk about this again in just a minute. Some problems that come with the basic gameplay formula are how the style meter builds, and just how easy a lot of the enemies can feel at times. I gotta say, it's kinda weird that Dante doesn't have a taunt either this time around. For how abrasive this guy is in the story, it seems like a no-brainer, but I guess, you know. <laughs> Seriously, the biggest offense this game brings to the hack and slash table is that in a lot of circumstances, pretty much every enemy will go down easily to strong attacks. 
This will also, in a lot of cases, boost your style rating to the highest possible level, netting you more red orbs at the end of every mission, and basically being very strong incentive to not experiment. It might seem like a simple concept, but using what works 100% of the time is what most people will do in a lot of games, newcomers especially. This is a very interesting topic that I'll get into way more in just a bit. For now, let's talk about the enemies that stand in your way. The forces of hell Dante goes up against in this title are well designed for the most part. Even though most of these demons are visually mannequin-like, they all have aesthetic differences that help you identify exactly how they'll act in combat. Basic mannequins often use arm blades, while some of the larger enemies carry shields that you have to break before you can deal damage effectively. And some demons have things like chainsaws that'll cancel your attacks and fuck you up pretty good if you're not paying attention. There are a variety of flying enemies which get totally owned by your guns, making Dante's pistols feel extra useful this time around. Other creatures like the witch can cover their fellow demons in a force field, adding to the tension and the on-the-fly decision-making of combat. The rage monsters will often rush at Dante with armored attacks that you can parry only using specific weapons, like Dante's fist weapon, Eryx, and Rebellion's overdrive slashes. A few enemies actually have armored rush attacks like this, notably the hulking tyrants that run straight for you. I love how the game itself just tells you outright that you can do advanced counters like this, like the ones I just mentioned, instead of risking the player never figuring such things out. It goes back to the dev's original goal of wanting everyone to be able to play this game stylishly and coming out feeling like a badass. Not every enemy is well designed, however. Some you'll encounter happen to be color-coded, only taking damage and stagger from specific demon or angel weapons. The Hell and Frost Knights, the Ghost and Blood Rage variants are some of the various color-coded enemies. These guys really suck on your first playthrough. A lot of the time when they show up in the early game, you'll most likely only have one of each colored weapon and not many attacks to go with them. This is obviously super restrictive from a basic gameplay standpoint. You'll be painfully mashing out the same attacks until they die, killing the fun and and flow of combat. Once you've got a few playthroughs under your belt, this problem is somewhat alleviated but not entirely taken care of. Even if you have every single unlockable skill for every weapon, the basic hack and slash gameplay formula is still being limited. You can't really experiment with these types of enemies. The game is literally stopping you in your tracks and telling you you have to play a certain way, which totally sucks. Imagine crafting a carefully curated combo that involves all of Dante's weapons. Well, if one of these guys shows up, have fun putting all of your hard work on the shelf for a while until you flowchart these guys to death. That being said, there is a lot of enemy variety in this reboot, and if you put these colorful fools aside for a minute and analyze everything else, most of it is really good. The enemies all being clearly identifiable as they appear and actually fun to fight against, counter, and style on is a huge plus in this game's favor. The demons you'll be triggering throughout this title are pretty sweet. Which reminds me, whatever happened to my devil trigger? It's been a while since I've seen it. Why don't we, uh, check it out together? Wait, that's it? My jacket turns red? Oh, my hair is white. That's kind of familiar looking and also extremely underwhelming. Where are my scales? Where are my wings? Where is my lightning? So yeah, devil trigger in this game is super weird. For one, the visuals are very boring. Instead of turning into an actual demon, Dante becomes player two colors, and the whole world turns blindingly white for whatever reason. Every single enemy around Dante floats in midair, encouraging you to start air comboing. The problem here is that DT doesn't last very long, so for a few seconds, Dante has this insane advantage against his foes, but can barely do anything creative that isn't just hooking himself up to them, spamming the same attacks until they die, and trying trying his best to hook his way to another enemy before the DT gauge runs out. You can obviously extend Devil Trigger with upgrades, but even then, DT doesn't last very long, even when you max out the meter. Now, I know some of you guys are probably ready to tackle me based on all of the gameplay stuff I've talked about so far. So yes, I'm going to address the other version now. So back in 2015, an updated version of this game was released. DMC, Devil May Cry, Definitive Edition. This re-release sought to improve on a lot of complaints fans had with the initial release of this very divisive reboot. Definitive Edition, or DE, changed a lot of stuff, like how Devil Trigger works, the style system got an overhaul in the hardcore mode, color-coded enemies now take damage from all weapons, and Dante comes equipped with an optional lock-on button. This version of the game also primarily runs at 60fps, where the vanilla console version was locked at 30. 
While I really appreciate a lot of the changes made in this version, I still have a few problems, so let's talk about those. The lock-on system in DE isn't as good as it should be. For one, it's not a real lock-on. Dante's Stinger can be mapped to a lock-on directional input, like the older games, but his entire animation framework is exactly the same as DMC Vanilla. Unlike the original DMCs, where when you locked on, Dante in those games was hard-focused on whichever enemy was in front of him, only being able to move forward, back, left, and right, allowing for for those satisfying lock-on directional attacks. Here, it's more of a camera lock-on, which isn't inherently bad, it just doesn't jive with me personally. I'd rather stick to the non-lock-on options available here. It also gets really confusing because when I'm holding down a lock-on button in a DMC game, I expect things like the launcher and dodge to also act in the same way it originally did, but those things are still mapped to single button presses, so you're not getting a full DMC-like lock-on here. Color-coded enemies taking damage from all weapons feels a little limp, unfortunately. While enemies can in fact take damage from all weapons now, they don't stagger like if you hit them with an appropriately colored weapon. So while you're comboing one of these fools, they can still attack and move around like nothing's happening to them. It feels very janky in my opinion. Whenever I play DE, I rarely take advantage of this new feature. I just default to using the assigned weapons, which totally sucks. It's not all doom and gloom, however. With this re-release, so many new modes and mechanical changes were implemented that offer a much improved experience. Turbo mode boosts the game's speed, making for quite the thrilling combat experience. Must style mode sees Dante only dealing damage with a high enough style rank. This mode really is for true Devil May Cry legends. There's a new hardcore mode, which is toggleable for every difficulty setting. Basically what this does is change how the style meter works, how parries function, enemies hit harder, and Devil Trigger now acts a lot more like it used to in the older DMC titles. That's right, enemies no longer float in the air for no reason, Dante gets a damage buff, his HP regens, and the meter burns a bit slower. I just gotta say, Hardcore is a massive improvement. I highly recommend using this setting if you're more familiar with the older games in this series. There is a much larger issue that unfortunately can't entirely be fixed, and that's DE being locked to PS4 and Xbox One. Sadly, there was never a PC release of this much improved version of the game. There are plenty of mods out there for the PC version of DMC Vanilla that allow you to mimic this experience, but that doesn't make up for how lame it is that there isn't an officially released better version of the game for all players. Most of the hardcore combo scene for this game in particular was on PC when Vanilla released. So having DE be available to those players would have been really nice, but that's not the world we live in, sadly. DE is a great experience if you haven't played this game yet. If you have access to a PS4, 5, Xbox One, or one of the series consoles, definitely check out this version of the game. The final gameplay element we have to talk about is a big one. This title's very interesting level design, so unlike the original Devil May Cry games, platforming and exploration play a much larger role. In the fragmented living world of Limbo, Dante has to explore explore an ever-changing environment. As you trek through this hellish but beautiful landscape, the ground itself will often shift, requiring you to jump, air dash, glide, and pull yourself around with your hook. It's pretty satisfying just doing the basic traversal in this game. Platforming was something that was barely touched on in the previous DMC games, and when it did show up, it always felt like an afterthought, something randomly put in place to spice up the basic gameplay. Honestly, in most action-heavy hack-and-slash games, when platforming shows up, it's usually pretty bad. Here in DMC Devil May Cry, it feels like a fully fleshed out and very intentional gameplay mechanic that the developers wanted to explore for this game's world and combat. In a lot of cases, during certain missions, platforming comes into play during basic combat. There are levels that use enemies as the final hook in a traversal scenario that opens up into combat. There's a level in particular where a glass floor is constantly breaking and dropping out underneath you while fighting flying enemies. This level in particular, there are endless opportunities to recover from falling off the stage by hooking on to an enemy and pulling yourself back up. It's really cool stuff that sets this game apart from other action titles of its kind. Of course, not everything is perfect. For all the good level design, exploration, and platforming, there are some pretty uninspired and boring traversal set pieces that make the game feel on rails at certain moments. This game released in 2013, which was still the era of cinematic games, so of course, some of that type of design finds itself in this Devil May Cry reboot. Boss fights are definitely affected with this type of boring, automated set 
piece design. By the way, secret missions also make their return, and most of the time are really fun. In the vanilla version of DMC, you had to find color-coded keys to open specific secret mission doors, which really sucked, by the way. Oh, what's that? You found a hidden door? Well, turn your ass around, because you don't have a golden key. In Definitive Edition, this was fixed. One type of key for all doors. Thank Sparta. With all of that said, I do really like the level design in this game. There's a lot to explore and a lot of collectibles to find on repeat playthroughs, adding to the game's replayability and longevity. So that's DMC's gameplay. You can really tell the devs wanted to make this thing feel like Devil May Cry, while also trying to make something completely new. The light of old DMC is faintly shining through the cracks, but not completely there. Believe it or not, but this game is doing some interesting things. I think this game is the only hack and slash title that achieves accessible stylish combat without feeling the need to dumb down literally everything about its core design. Like air combos being super viable in combat and a focus the devs wanted to experiment with is really cool to see. It's a shame the release version is as weirdly jank in a lot of areas as it is, but at least the definitive edition makes up for it in a lot of areas. A lot of people love to say there's nothing good about this game, and clearly that isn't true. It's a competently made, polished action game. Even if you hate everything about Ninja Theory, you still have to recognize that, like, Hideaki Itsuno helped make this game. It's clear that his design philosophy can be felt in this reboot. The way Dante attacks with slow, built-up animations that pay off in a big impact, and how certain enemies were designed, it's there for sure. Is it as good or memorable as some of the previous DMC games? I personally don't think so, but the gameplay is fun. And that's kind of all it has to be, right? This is a reboot, it's not a continuation of those original Devil May Cry games. It's nowhere near DMC2 levels of crap design, and it sure as hell blew its action game contemporaries out of the water in terms of delivering a satisfying, deep gameplay experience. So now that we've got the actual game part of DMC out of the way, let's talk about the absolutely bizarre story this game is telling. In this version of Devil May Cry, we play as Dante, a half-demon angel Nephilim who's slumming it big time living out of a trailer at a theme park. This game quickly shows us how cool Dante is by showing him partying, he's drinking beers, he's smoking, going to the club, living it up, fucking bitches. I am trying. <laughs> At the same time, we see our main villain, Mundus, the king of hell, in his human world form. He's a big businessman who has the US president and likely every earthly corporation on his payroll. Dante wakes up one morning to a girl named Cat knocking at his door with a warning of demonic danger heading his way. Just as Cat shows up, so do the demons. Dante Dante is dragged into limbo, and after killing the arch demon that trapped him there, Cat brings him to her safe house, which happens to be the Order's HQ, an underground demon fighting resistance group run by a man named Virgil. Dante and Virgil are brothers, and after a quick visit to their condemned family home, Dante learns more about his mother and father, how Mundus killed his mother and enslaved his father to eternal CBT in Limbo's most popular BDSM club. No matter how many times I re-record this line, I can't, I can't get through it without laughing. After remembering this, Dante agrees to join Virgil and Kat in their quest to expose key members of Mundus's organization and killing them in the hopes to free the world from demon control. I don't like the story or the characters in this game. I think it's all pretty basic. A lot of it feels like missed opportunities to actually tell some interesting real-world stories through the lens of Devil May Cry. A lot of what happens is also pretty cringeworthy. For me, all of the characters are unlikable. There isn't a single person in this story that I identified with or really cared about. And now that a lot of time has passed since this game's release, I think a lot of what happens in the story hasn't aged too well either. Like seriously, every female character in this game is called a whore in one way or another. I'm not an anti-cursing puritan by any means, because I personally love swearing like a sailor, but the foul language in this game comes off as very try-hard in most scenes and just mean-spirited in general. It's impressive how dated this game felt for its time. The humor feels like something out of an early 2000s edgy action movie, which often clashes with the darker aesthetic this game forgets it's going for most of the time. Reboot Dante is probably the most unlikable action game protagonist of all time. From scene one all the way to the end, he annoyed me. He's so mean to basically everyone at all times. His humor is the most mixed bag I've ever seen. Sometimes the jokes hit. The worst of them is Dante. The whole world would benefit greatly by his non-existence. I'm taking you off the air. Most of the times they miss. So which one of your fat asses wants to be Limbo's biggest loser? Congratulations. You win. And occasionally, a joke will miss so hard that it loops all the way back around and becomes a hit. 
What in the shitting hell is going on here? It's such a drastic shift from what we know of the original Dante. It's like Capcom told NT to make this Dante the complete opposite in the personality department. This Dante never seems like he's having fun with any of the bosses in this game either. He's just shitty to them. Well, I guess it kinda works, because every boss is also so realistically shitty back to him, unlike the original games where bosses were very theatrically villainous. I said this at the start, but I really wish NT just followed through with how this Dante was first presented to us. A quiet quiet, dark loner who, yes, smoke cigarettes. I dream of a world where I can play a DMC Devil May Cry, where Dante is like a thoughtful, quiet person who opens up to Cat and Virgil as the game goes on, instead of just being an asshole the entire time. Can you imagine if like Cat or Virgil were like, hey Dante, maybe quit smoking, it's bad for you. And at the start, he doesn't listen, but as he grows into a real devil-hunting savior of humanity, he begins to smoke less and eventually quits. You know, a cute detail that would humanize this totally weird weird protagonist. Oh well, my dreams mean nothing. By the way, I absolutely love the lead conceptual artist Ninja Theory often employs for their games, Telexi, but this painting really bothers me. Like, ew, stop Dante, that's, that's gross. Our leading lady, Kat, is also kinda lame. On paper, she seems like a character that I would really like. A depressed loner who escaped abuse by trapping herself in limbo and eventually mastering how to travel between both worlds. Unfortunately, in the final game, she's really boring and it's hard for me to care about the things she goes through. Even though her and Dante don't really get a lot of relationship progression throughout the story, they do work as a team and a lot of the time their interactions boil down to, whoa, you went through some crazy stuff as a kid, whoa, and that's it. I think by the end we're supposed to believe that these two like each other in a romantic way, but I just don't buy it. I would have loved to see some actual progression in a romantic direction. Have these two kids kiss or something. Make them relate with each other before Kat's stolen away by the demons. I guess that would require Dante to seem like he cares about anything, which he clearly doesn't, until he has to at the end. It all feels very flat and forced to me. It's been said before, but yeah, there's a lot of social political commentary going on in this game, with themes of the government controlling the masses, fighting back against that power, and taking down the man. I don't think any of this stuff is executed to the level it should be to make any of it interesting. Like, the Bill O'Reilly memes are right in your face and are fantastic, but there isn't enough street-level character to really flesh out the game's world. There's a level where Virgil's hideout is getting raided by a SWAT team in the real world while Dante's trapped in limbo. There's a somewhat powerful scene where Dante is frantically telling Kat what to do to not come off like she's resisting arrest. I like the idea of this scene a lot, but if you look a bit deeper, it's just a whole lot of wasted potential. I wish there was more of this type of police drama throughout the story. We don't even get a name for the city we're in, or the police department that's doing this raid. An extra level that maybe showed off how the police operate in this demon-infested government would have helped make the surveillance state idea stand out even more. One of the best levels in this game sees Cat and Dante having to disable demon security cameras throughout a part of the city. I really like the small amount of relationship building here, but right after this chapter, a lot of this subject matter is never touched on again. I think there needed to be one more level where, through gameplay, Cat and Dante explore a neighborhood under heavy police control. Maybe there could be two or three spots where high-ranking demons in human disguises patrol around. Cat and Dante would have to work together again to find out who these guys are and take them out all while learning more about how the police system works in the city, and seeing how humans live under their control. I wanted more of that type of stuff, and you know, maybe it would have been a great opportunity to develop Cat and Dante. Like this lonely human is seeing this otherworldly Nephilim fighting the power on street level, showing that he actually cares about normal humans. By far my least favorite thing about this game is Virgil. He's a character that I think is supposed to represent the angel side of the Nephilim dichotomy. Where Dante represents the wild at heart, dirty, demon aesthetic, Virgil represents the prim and proper, stuck up dipshit angel side. I get that it's fun to flip those characters on their head, like, oh the devil was the good guy the whole time, but neither of these fools are likable so it's difficult to relate to their goals. Virgil is so lame. When he's not talking down to everyone in a condescending way, he's 
either bitching or ruining his own plans. Halfway through the story, when Kat is kidnapped by Mundus, Virgil and Dante come up with a plan to steal Mundus's mistress, Lilith, who is currently carrying his child. An exchange takes place for both women, where Virgil absolutely annihilates Lilith, killing her and her unborn child. Talk about a 45 caliber abortion. <laughs> who writes this shit? What strong female characters we have here. Not like that pesky lady or Trish. After this, you don't trust Virgil anymore, right? Lilith and her baby are villains, yes. But what Virgil did is pretty messed up, right guys? God, look at Virgil's car. There's a giant V on the grill. Oh my god. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Virgile Mobile. After you defeat Mundus, Virgil has a pretty sudden villain transformation, wanting to rule over and control the surviving humans. Dante stops him in an incredibly easy boss fight. Like, I don't know if NT was trying to make this guy seem intimidating, but when I'm juggling him in the air and the camera awkwardly follows his lifeless body getting flung around, I just can't help but think he's kinda lame. Like seriously, what is going on here? Was the intention to make Virgil look as weak as possible? Cause that's how he comes off. It would have been so easy making this guy more intimidating. I can totally see it. Check out some of this awesome fan art. Virgil looks so cool here. I only wish he did in the actual game. So anyway, you beat Virgil. He runs away through a portal. Cat literally says to Dante and us that this Dante is the Dante. Dante touches her bottom and then we get a social media hashtag. Okay. Oh, by the way, Dante finally has white hair. Look, I was right. This game was a build up to the white hair. There is a Virgil DLC, but honestly, there isn't much to talk about with it. It explores this very weak Virgil's mental state as he fights his way out of hell itself, eventually becoming corrupt and in command of a demon army. It's trying to set up a sequel to this game, but that never happened, obviously. DMC Devil May Cry's story is the real problem for me. Whenever I replay this game, I always skip every cutscene. I play the game as Neo Dante, which I personally think should have been his default costume, and seemingly forget about how terrible the narrative and characters are. When people complain about this game and trash it for being quote unquote the worst game ever made, I don't think anyone besides hardcore players are thinking about the gameplay. In retrospect, this title is so needlessly edgy and upsetting in a lot of ways through its story. If not for this very strange narrative, I would say based on the combat alone, DMC Devil May Cry could have potentially been an all-time classic. Unfortunately, the story really brings down the overall experience. Like, did you notice how I barely mentioned Mundus? He hates women, he hates Dante, he has bald hair, and is an evil businessman. That's all of his character. This is the villain of the game, people. You know, it's really difficult to just reboot an iconic franchise like this, let alone make something that feels so out of the realm of what made that franchise great in the first place. I believe Ninja Theory had good intentions with this game at the start. It's very obvious, if you look at the mountain of concept art contained within this game, that this thing was supposed to be something a little more in line with what we were familiar with. It's well documented that Capcom HQ played a big part in the change of direction. Ninja Theory are a great developer that makes awesome games, both before and after DMC. I mean, Hellblade is fantastic. Heavenly Sword is a classic. DMC Devil May Cry feels like what happens if you take a very focused team of people and make them create something that isn't really in their wheelhouse. Like, it's so shocking to me that all of their other games, and I mean all of their games, have amazing stories. Like, what happened here? It's funny looking back at the comments on the original announcement trailer for this game. They mostly echo the same feelings I had when I first saw that video back in 2010. Man, this trailer doesn't feel anything like the game we got. I hope you guys understand where I'm coming from with this video. DMC Devil May Cry is not the worst thing ever, like a lot of people say. I do think it's worth playing if you are into hack and slash games. Ninja Theory is a game developer that I have a lot of respect for. Their games are great, and they've grown a lot for the better since this title's release. I look at the DMC reboot as a cautionary tale of what not to do when rebooting an already beloved franchise. It's hard to look back at this title and feel angry or sad. We all got what we wanted at the end of the day. So maybe check this thing out again and see if you're as pissed off as you were back when this game came out. Since day one, this reboot was well and truly cursed. And with that said, that's where I'll close the book on this chapter of Devil May Cry.